Dear colleagues, thank you for joining us in this roundtable, COVID-19 and cancer a year later. We decided to conduct this roundtable to let us know where we are one year after the pandemic has started. This year has affected everyone, and there have been a few rays of sunshine on the horizon. But however, there are many drawbacks that have come up. We're here not only to highlight the great accomplishments, but also to spotlight the issues that could be improved in order to help us get through this pandemic with a sense of equality. We have chosen 10 topics that are very pertinent to our patients and those in cancer care. Our discussants will give their take and even give us their view on their possible future. It is my extreme honor to introduce the participants in this discussion, all of which are members of the OnCoAlert faculty. Ms. Jill Feldman from the EGFR Resisters, Dr. Tony Schwering from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, Dr. Ishwara Subaya from MD Anderson, Dr. Ben Solomon from Peter Mack in Australia, Dr. Solange Peters from the European Society for Medical Oncology, Dr. Vivek Subaya from MD Anderson, Dr. Giuseppe Curigiano from the European Society for Medical Oncology, Dr. Herbert Long from the Chinese University of Hong Kong. I am your moderator, Gilbert Morgan, from Texas, practicing oncologist in Southern Sweden. It is an honor for Uncle to bring you this roundtable, and we thank you for your support. And without further delay, let's start the discussion. The prioritization of cancer patients. Currently, there are over 60 COVID vaccines in development. There's very limited data on the safety, tolerability, and efficacy of those vaccines in patients with cancer. Due to the exclusion of patients with active malignancies from trials, the rapid generation of this data is crucial taking into consideration the high morbidity and mortality from COVID-19 in patients with cancer, organizations and society like AACR, ASCO, ESMO, and many others have released their preliminary recommendations supporting vaccinations in all patients with cancer, including those under active therapy. What do you see as the biggest hurdle to incorporate these recommendations in different countries? How do we address the different prioritization of cancer patients and the vaccine worldwide. We start off with Dr. Peters. Um, well, knowing and considering uh, what we don't need to discuss anymore is the high risk uh, and the vulnerability of cancer patients, many of us and many scientific societies uh, consider now that uh, cancer patients should be prioritized as probably the first tier, right, for vaccination against COVID. Uh, basically, it follows, and it was the first statement of WHO in trying to prioritize people for vaccination. It follows the few important principles who, which help prioritizing groups of people for vaccine. First of all, is to reduce the deaths, the death rate, and the disease burden, which, of course, characterizes cancer patients. The second thing, of course, is to protect the system. So there's something in this first year, which is about also the people who take care of cancer patients and of patients in general. But the third one is to make this particular focus on the vulnerable ones, right? The ones we know who will be the victim of COVID first. And that's why WHO has uh, officially stated that they should be prioritized, our cancer patients. And we also made in Europe this um, call, the European Society for Medical Oncology, the ESMO call for action, which is now signed by around 50 uh, cancer related societies, which really is pushing each country, remember Europe is complex, each country to consider cancer patients to be in the first year to be prioritized for cancer for, for vaccination. The reason is really the high mo mortality. And I guess that the numbers between 20 and up to more than 40% for hematological malignancy is just the reality of what we unfortunately met during the, the COVID first wave, second wave, and maybe the third wave to come. Of course, apart from this uh, political word, we need also to diligently collect data about what we do, because as you know, this population was fully represented or not represented in the trials. And last but not least, we need to encourage our patients to do that, to come to join and to be vaccinated despite everything you can hear around. But I think we follow basic principles of being here, standing beside the ones who are the most fragile. We do it as a job on a daily basis and we have to do it more at the time of COVID. Thank you, Dr. Peters. Dr. Solomon. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks very much, uh, Jill. Um, 
So I think um, Solange has uh, very clearly outlined that it's well recognized that patients with cancer are at increased risk of complications and death um, from COVID-19. So it's critical to make sure that uh, patients or people with cancer are prioritized for vaccines. But we know that the rollout, that the logistics and the rollout of COVID vaccination across the world is going to be complex. We know that in many parts of the world, uh, this will extend probably until next year. And it's important in that context that we make sure that we appropriately prioritize people who are at greatest risk and therefore potentially of greatest benefit from, from the vaccine. And I think it is incumbent on us as oncologists and our professional science societies, as well as uh, the voice of the patients, which is a very powerful voice to make sure that prioritization occurs. And, um, and as again, as Solange has mentioned, in the first sort of group of uh, people to get um, vaccinated, it's critical that we make sure that, um, uh, that uh, people with cancer and people who look after patients with cancer are in, in that group. I think another important issue is the issue of um, vaccine hesitancy. Um, there are some, uh, some patients who have very understandable concerns about the risks of vaccination. And, and this particularly may be the case in parts of the world where so far um, there hasn't been a big impact in terms of patient numbers um, on COVID-19 parts of the world like Asia uh, and, and Australia as well. And it's important um, that uh, we speak with, um, uh, with, with patients about the potential benefits of vaccination and overcome many of the myths that are out there in social media about that. And I think it's important that um, our professional groups and our patient advocacy groups uh, do the same. Thank you, Dr. Solomon. Dr. Kujijano. So hello, good evening. It's really great to be with you from all over the world. So I completely agree with uh, my president of the European Society for Medical Oncology. Uh, our society has been the first uh, to increase awareness uh, for cancer patients prioritization for treatment, of course, uh, and to allocate specific resource for their protection. I remember with the first wave in Milan, uh, thousands of people died due to COVID. There was no prioritization for them. So every patient with cancer arriving in an emergency room just because um, of cancer, uh, there was no priority for them. So now we have to completely change uh, the scenario. We need to increase awareness. We have to give voice to our patients. They should be prioritized for vaccination. This is quite important. And I am sure that any one of you had the opportunity to see today the press release uh, of the Crick Institute in UK, in which is quite clear that one shot of vaccine, mRNA vaccine of Pfizer BioNTech, it's not enough for them. So the UK policy should be absolutely changed. This is a small study, including 54 patients with cancer, hematological malignancies, and solid tumors. They received one shot of the Pfizer BioNTech vaccine. And after three weeks, only 24% of them had a zero conversion uh, to IgG and IgM. So it means we need two shots for them in order to have a complete immune response to COVID-19. So it's quite important for all of us to increase awareness of patients to convince health authorities that the politics of one shot is not good in Europe. Maybe you don't know that in Europe, we have actually a great challenge to have vaccination for, uh, for the general population and also for our patients. There is specifically a really shortage for availability of vaccination in my country, in France, in Spain. So I am not only discussing about Italy, I am discussing also of other big countries in Europe, also in Germany. So it's really important to increase availability of vaccines in our countries and to give absolutely priority to frail patients and exactly to cancer patients. So this is my strong message for the audience.
Thank you, Dr. Kritajano. Ms. Feldman. Thank you, Dill. And I uh, will not repeat everything everyone else said is so spot on. But just to add on to a few of the things, I think there is a lot of hesitancy in the community. And I think that comes from confusion and the lack of communication and communicating effectively with patients and educating patients. And it seems to be when people say, or when there are guidelines that say that absolutely people with cancer are at a higher risk of severity and mortality, well, what does that mean? What, which people with cancer? Does that mean people who are in active treatment? Does that mean people who had cancer but haven't been in treatment? Uh, people who maybe had cancer and let's say lung cancer had a lung removed, are they at a higher risk than another person who had cancer? So within the community, there is still what, what does that look like? What does that mean? And there hasn't been great communication with patients from all over the world. So in our communities, people from all over the world are talking about this. So, you know, we're trying to get the information out there as well, while waiting for vaccines, while what is best practice to do. And in the same, you know, at the same time, we're trying to really figure out how can we, how can we help people who need to get the vaccines understand all of this? And so it's really, I think, a lot of confusion in terms of the broad statement, prioritizing vaccines for people with cancer and or survivors of cancer. And also the hesitancy is also because people don't understand how the vaccine works. So we had somebody in the community the other day say, are, are you know, reaching out to us, are, is anyone here getting the vaccine? I don't think we should get it. I heard that it could change our DNA. So, you know, even if we're prioritizing people in the community or even if we're prioritizing people with cancer, there is a lot of pushback from the patients with fear of not knowing even what the vaccine is or how it works. So I think that all boils down to really, I would ask for better communication, you know, being effectively communicate with your patients and educating patients. Thank you very much, Ms. Feldman. There are many hoops people have to go through to get the vaccine, and these are specifically hard for people with cancer. The digital divide is making it particularly difficult to deliver the vaccine to those who need it most. This includes uneven access to computers, computer skills, and the internet. Internet access lacks among the elderly, as well as Black, Latin, Native American, and rural communities, all among those hit hardest by the pandemic. How do we make getting the vaccine easier for our patients undergoing cancer treatments, and how would this help? Is it reasonable that people with cancer should have to chase down a vaccine via websites that require them to not only be tech savvy, but to also have time to keep trying to get the vaccine? Ms. Feldman? Great, thank you. I think we need all hands on deck here. Um, I, you know, in, in the United States, the process differs by state, by county, by city. They've made it so complicated, I think, all over that the people who need the vaccine aren't even getting it. It would be extremely helpful if cancer centers could help their patients um, and I understand not all centers have the process to go through and vaccinate their patients, but help them with the registration process. Uh, you know, through records alone, we know which patients live in certain communities who don't speak English, who are older, who don't have access to technology. So it does, it makes the most sense for, you know, our cancer centers, our physicians, our nurses, 
to help people get the vaccine. It would definitely be ideal and it would make the most sense if people could get the vaccines when they come in for their appointments or their scans or their treatments. I mean, if you think about it, uh, people who are in active treatment have to go in frequently. So not only are they at a higher risk of severity, complications and death, but they're actually putting themselves at a risk every time they go into the cancer center. So it, it, it's crazy that people who you know that who are who have anxiety anyway about having cancer are faced with this anxiety and confusion about trying to get on the internet trying to secure an appointment i mean there has to be a way that we can use digital health apps or ehrs to work with patients and help them i think that um you know, in addition to ensuring that they have access to the vaccines, it's really making sure that, again, people have clear information that explains how and when they can obtain the vaccine and address any concerns or questions they have. I mean, that's really important. Like, you know, what if I get COVID before I get the vaccine? What if I've had an allergic reaction to chemotherapy? Should I still get the vaccine? Or, you know, is there any evidence that the vaccine, you know, could, in, you know, improve my treatment response or increase the toxicity of my treatment? People have asked, should I be taking vitamin D? I mean, there are so many different um different ways that the cancer centers could work with the patients. And going back to, you know, the data thing a lot, I mean, I've had the vaccine before I was actually eligible, but um, I, you know, I get questions. I signed up for all vax here in the United States or in is, I don't know if it's called all vax, but anyway, I get every day a text where I fill out information about how I feel. Well, to me, it would make sense if I was filling out something that would go to my oncologist at well, or that would go to whatever study or research was being done at, done as well. So I don't know if our you know cancer centers could work on that as well, but that is a lot of information that they could be getting that would help in the future. Dr. Peters. Not, not easy to, to follow Jill, but uh, I, I will complete. Um, well, about getting the vaccine today for our patients. We have to keep in mind that it, had be, it has been a huge burden since the beginning in 2020 of the pandemic for our patients, right? It has been a terrible time, first of all, because their follow-up, their optimal cancer care, the treatment has been somehow questioned, right? By the venue to the hospital, by the health system, which has been broken, for example, in probably half of the European countries, or at least slows down. So I think it has been a succession, a successive series of anxiety events, right? Uh, just from uh, my cancer treatments to the COVID, to the venues, to the hospital, to the protective equipment, equipment, and now comes a vaccine, right? And again, it's just anxiety because every country has its own regulation, right? And once suddenly you are defined as being uh, I would say eligible for vaccine, the process is a huge burden again. It's, it's kind of a mess. It's a, it's a fight. It's a fight to get an appointment. And it's quite important in Europe, for example, to keep in mind that the vaccination process, the vaccine process is out of the hands of oncologists, right? It's in the hands of the uh, national system. So it means I cannot deliver vaccine in my service. It's completely outsourced, if you want, because it's centralized uh, uh, by the country, and, and that's the case in most European countries. So it's quite interesting just to keep in mind that if it has been tough for us, it has been a thousand, more, a thousand times more difficult for cancer patients from the treatment, from the follow-up, from the screening, now to the vaccine. So how can we help? Probably we've been 
a little insufficient or we need it sometimes to adapt in terms of communication, right? So there's not so many things we can do in terms of how many vaccines come to our country, but what we can do is to try to support our patients in everything which is related to communication. And one of these is potentially, first of all, to make sure they are informed about, about how to get an appointment and about all of this concern and worries which are related to vaccine. And this is our duty because nobody else can speak about vaccine and immunotherapy, vaccine and surgery and so on and so forth. And the second thing is probably to support our cancer patients into this registration process, vaccine appointments, because as it was told before, many countries use internet-based appointments and the median age of a patient is still close to 70 years old, right? So they are not the generation of, I would say, web uh, fans or addict people. And by the way, they probably have no time or energy to fight and to learn. So I think we really need probably to, to try to find a way and the resource, and it's a transcendent type of resource, to be here and to help them to know when and how to get the vaccine. It's also about protecting their privacy. Because what I saw in Switzerland, and I wrote many letters to my patients to explain how to do, is suddenly when you come to a hotline or to a website, you are asked questions which sometimes go beyond what is needed to get the vaccine. And as you know, our patients are always questioned about the veracity of everything they do. So I think the last thing we would like is them to have the obligation to tell about their history, their cancer, and their treatments. So I think we need here really to understand that we need to do it with them. Even if it costs you two nurses, three nurses uh, for maybe 12 months, I hope only six, but it might be 12. I think that's one of the things we should probably put in place, uh, replacing the fact that vaccine is not delivered in our services. Dr. Schreier. Yeah, um, you know, I mean, I, I listened to my colleagues and, um, you know, I, I, wanna, I wanna start by a, a way more positive note, how at least the pandemic to cancer patient was handled in the ecosystem. They're a very rich ecosystem. I am proud to be part of here in uh, Boston. Uh, you know, we've been involved initially uh, early on in uh, research and uh, a lot of the folks, um, part of the infectious disease at the Brigham were leading actually the large vaccine trials here. So we were part of an ecosystem rich in that and uh, we did benefit. Um, uh, what I want to say is that the levels of understanding and help for cancer patient was a bit, um, you know, different. If you look at it at the national level, and I can speak mainly for the U.S., but then more so at our local level at the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute in Boston, Mass., and then even at a very small uh, ecosystem uh, level in the GU division that. Uh, uh, I lead. I think overall uh, folks have organized things uh, quite well. There were resources, for example, my society, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, if you go on the website, there are resources about, you know, COVID and, uh, uh, you know, ASCO COVID uh, resources, including a road to recovery report and a guide to cancer care delivery during uh, uh, the pandemic. And a lot of it there is a report about the vaccine and patient with cancer, what to do. Now, a lot of these reports, I have to say, and I agree with Jill here, are geared toward the providers and the physician coming it and giving it for patient. And sometimes it doesn't happen. The info is there. It doesn't mean the provider you know, is giving it. So what happened, at, at least at our institution, is that starting in... In February, we started vaccinating patients at our location in Chestnut Hill. We started with 350 and scaled up to uh, 500. And the patient were provided either email or a text message when they're eligible. And we determined the eligibility uh, based, so we reach out to patient. Uh, we determined the eligibility really based on the state the statewide approaches that is based on age, 75, 65, plus two comorbidities, then one comorbidity. And inside each phase, if you want, we actually did a couple of uh, subtleties where we stratified the patient that are eligible week ahead, two weeks ahead, is based on the systemic therapy. Obviously the CAR T cell patient, the patient on systemic therapy, 
on chronic oral therapy. And it, it went, you know, uh, you know, very well. Uh, you know, at our level, now going back to the level of the division, and I love, uh, you know, localism. I'm a big fan of localism overall. Uh, in the GU division, we teamed, out, uh, teamed up with the breast cancer division, and we're starting studies and research. We started just now, opened last week, a vaccine study where patients that get vaccinated, whether at Dana-Farber with their primary care or IELTS, perhaps are able to consent to a study that collect the blood at baseline and at specific time point, because all these studies, the thousands and thousands of patients that led to the approval uh, do, did not mainly include cancer patients. And we don't know the immunological response in these cancer patients. We don't know the side effects that they're gonna have on and on. We heard from Giuseppe here that, uh, you know, one shot is not potentially uh, protective, which I do not completely agree with because I think that uh, the immune system is way too uh, complex, uh, you know, to understand. And there's a lot of element that we don't understand. And if you look at the Israeli experience and other, the cases of mortality from COVID or very severe COVID, the most important remain very low. So I think, you know, I'm very happy to be part of panel and, and listening to different experience inside the U.S. or even, you know, outside. Our next topic is minorities with cancer. According to the findings from the Ask a Quality Care Symposium, Black and Hispanic patients with cancer may be more likely to be infected with COVID-19 than white patients. However, Latino and Black Americans see lowest COVID-19 vaccination rates in the U.S., a report from The Guardian shows that 3% of Latinos and 4.5% of Blacks have received shots compared to 9.1% of white Americans and 8.6% of Asian Americans. In your opinion, how can this be addressed to help those two large groups of people? Dr. Subaya? And so when we reflect on the COVID-19 vaccination rates, we're seeing the data come in, right? The Centers for Disease Control puts out the US vaccination rates from those states that do report it. And the data is very clear. It is reflecting what we suspected would happen, which is that the, the, those, the majority of those who did receive the vaccine, 65% were Caucasian, 9% were Hispanic, 7% were Black, 5% were Asian and 2% were American Indian um, or an Alaskan native. So if we look at the over the two thirds of the patients who did receive the vaccine identified as Caucasian and 9% Hispanic. And so when we look at these numbers, um, we have to put those in the context of the illness itself. And so when we look at those states that do report the racial breakdown of their cases with the um, of COVID-19, if we just use Arizona as an example, 13% um, um, of the vaccinations in Arizona was uh, went to the his, uh, uh, somebody who identified as Hispanic. So that's 13% of vaccinations. But the Hispanic population in Arizona accounted for 36% of the cases and 31% of the deaths. And they make up 32% of the total population. If you look at the Black community, the findings are similar. For example, in Maryland, they received 17% of the vaccinations, but they made up 33% of the cases, 35% of the deaths, and are the uh, make up 30% of the state's population. Um, these are important numbers, and they're through the Kaiser Family Foundation. And I, we have to look at these because we we could see this coming. This is the type of healthcare disparity that is that has been long standing and covid-19 has amplified the health disparities in different settings that we've already studied in different settings now in the context of the pandemic so what does that mean for us if we're looking to improve the vaccination rates in specific populations then we have to take the messaging to them and this means that understanding, reflecting on previous experiences in act, uh, improving outreach to that population. So in the United States, the Affordable Care Act was one such, one such um, initiative where there was very targeted outreach and enrollment efforts in those hard to reach communities that led to successful enrollment. And so if you're looking at a um, equitable distribution of the vaccine, 
it's it truly is about maintaining outreach efforts that look beyond information and pamphlets that you may put out as a as a single institution. Ms. Feldman. Yes, uh, this is just wrong. I mean, it's we knew from the beginning the disproportion you know, how it affected people from underserved communities, not even the high rate of developing COVID-19, but the high rate of death. We knew that, that, that it just, okay. But anyway, um, you know, a, a lot of people, first of all, the statistics we just heard, right? And they they aren't surprising, but they're very upsetting. And a lot of what you hear is, oh, it's about the trust. People in those communities don't necessarily trust the system, which is a factor. But, you know, it's not the only factor. There's also people don't know that it's free. Um, access is the biggest issue. You, the system is designed for people who have access to internet, smartphones, or computers. And the, that, that just widens the disparities. And here in the United States, just because I can give an example here, you know, there's a Dallas County in Texas. They tried to prioritize vaccines for the mostly black and Latino people in their community. And the state of Texas threatened to cut the number of doses they will get if they do that. And there is a county in Birmingham, Alabama that primarily serves the lower income people from a black neighborhood. And they have not administered at a, as of a day or two ago, they have not administered one single vaccine yet. So it, the disparities, there are global disparities here, but the, dis the disparity is local to the country, the state, the community. And in the US, the way healthcare works is it's assumed that people have the resources to get the healthcare they need. And there have been mass, va mass vaccination sites, which are great and they have a lot of people, but not all. Vaccines must be brought to the communities in need. That is the only way because of the barriers that people face. And the CDC does have the uh, SVI, the Social Vulnerability Index, that can be used uh, for a distrib distribution plan to enhance vaccine supplies in some of the under-resourced areas. But the communities also need help and they need the resources to actually be able to vaccinate people. They need the proper storage and they need the healthcare workers to administer the shots. These, this isn't surprising and this is something that we should have been aware of, but definitely something that we can take the steps now to help mitigate more of these barriers. Don't. Uh, can do a comment on this because, uh, of course, uh, it's important to consider disparities in the context of the United States, that is uh, the largest market in the world for vaccines, actually. And as I said before, in my country, in Italy, we don't have access uh, to all the vaccines, actually, because uh, there is a uh, really a shortage of the vaccines. So even if we started with a process of mass vaccination, we don't have the opportunity to do vaccination for all the population in a short time. So we are discussing about one year to complete vaccination of a population of 60 million people. But what's about other countries or other continents like uh, India, like uh, Africa, where actually there is absolutely no access to vaccines. So I completely agree that we need a global policy in order to guarantee access to vaccination all over the world because cancer patients and are also in Africa, are also in India, or are also in other parts of the world. 
So I, I believe we should also stress this concept. Thank you very much. The next topic is global inequities and access to the vaccine. Vaccinations have so far had overwhelming favor in high-income countries, with most low-income countries receiving their vaccines doses through the whole program COVAX. However, the rollout has been very slow in these countries. A study from the People's Vaccine Alliance found that at least 90% of people in lower-income countries are unlikely to be vaccinated by the end of 2021. In January 2021, research from the Duke University Global Health Institute found that high-income countries were responsible for 60% of the COVID-19 vaccine purchases, although they make up only 16% of the world's population. How big is the problem of vaccine hoarding by rich countries, and what are the negative consequences that could come if we continue? Subsequently, what can be done at a country level and at the societal level to address this? Dr. Solomon? Uh, thanks, Jill, and I completely agree with Giuseppe's comments uh, earlier. The, the pandemic is, is a global problem, and the solution has to be a global one as well. And you can understand why governments um, prioritize securing uh, vaccines for their own country's population. That's very understandable. But it does create a big gap between the wealthy countries and the you know, and the less wealthy countries, the poor countries, and and that that is a incredibly wide wide gap. Um, I've heard an estimate that, um, and and I guess this this has been called vaccine nationalism. I've heard an estimate that once uh, the United States vaccinates its entire population, there'll be still something like 450 million doses of vaccine <clears throat> that have been secured, um, that have been allocated to, to the US. And, um, and I think this speaks to the need for global cooperation. And I think there are some really positive signs that this is starting to happen. Um, there is an entity called COVAX, which has been organized by the United Nations, which, um, which works towards the, the goal of equitable distribution of um, vaccines. And as Jill pointed out, um, in the context of the US, and this applies perhaps even more so globally, it's not just allocation of um, vaccine, it's, um, it's having the storage facilities, the, the healthcare workers who can uh, do the vaccines. And there are countries that um, will need help from um, wealthier countries. Um, I, think, I think it's amazing. It's, it's interesting. It's amazing that this is starting to happen. And there are other efforts that perhaps we hear less of, uh, you know, India supporting vaccinations in Africa, um, the Chinese and the Russians um, uh, supporting vaccinations around Asia. So um, I, I think we are seeing that the world can, can and must work together to, uh, to get on top of this pandemic. Dr. Long. Yeah, thanks. And, and uh, it's, it's 5.47, uh, so I'm more awake now. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, just to echo Ben's comments and um, and everybody else's comments, uh, I think this uh, issue with vaccine hoarding is is a real problem. And in actual fact, although there have been developments uh, between different countries as well as the WHO leading COVAX, um, I do feel that this would be a big problem to come. I think aside from the inability to have access to uh, a good treatment uh, or prevention for the world's population, I think the biggest issue is also this would delay the entire recovery of COVID for the entire world, just because of the fact that we do need the herd immunity. And you know we could have herd immunity within a small community, within a country, but globally we need this herd immunity as well. And hoarding the vaccines in various stockpiles, and yet we have the high risk uh, groups, especially in developing countries where the healthcare system is not adequate so that if you get COVID, unfortunately, your mortality rates are even higher than the developed countries. Uh, I think at the end of the day, this would just slow the, um, the, the growth and the recovery of the entire uh, world. And certainly that has impacts on the ecosystem in terms of finances and, and, and economies as well. And in a way, it's sort of counterintuitive because you would think that it's the, um, the more affluent nations who are 
very worried about, say, economics. But yet, on the other hand, I think this would bite them at the end. So I think what needs to be done, as Ben has mentioned, is this uh, international initiatives of making sure that these vaccine supplies are, uh, are spread fairly uh, around the world. Um, and uh, honestly, I, I, I'm not in full knowledge of what the shelf lives are uh, of these particular uh, vaccines being stockpiled. I don't know how long they can be kept. And uh, it would really be a waste uh, if they are going to be stockpiled and then not used at the end of the day. So, um, so these are just my quick comments. The current vaccine. There's currently eight vaccines being administered worldwide, with Pfizer BioNTech being the most widely used, followed by Moderna, then Oxford AstraZeneca, all of these which are two dose vaccines. With the introduction of the Johnson and Johnson vaccine, which is a one shot, no need for freezer storage, easier to transport to underserved areas and poor countries. Do you see this as a game changer and why? Is there something else that could make for a better vaccine than that which Johnson & Johnson has come out with? Dr. Shore? So uh, Gail, uh, being a cautious uh, oncologist who treats usually metastatic patient, I try to avoid words like game changer. Um, so, because I don't know what actually it means. I can tell you that uh, the J&J &J is as close to a game changer as possible. I mean, we live, I told you the ecosystem, I'm lucky to be part of, this was not a plan, but I think when we start looking at disparities and delivery and all that, everything helped. To have a vaccine that doesn't need to be stored, very cold temperature, is one shot, you don't have to worry about it. We talk about you know, chemotherapy compliance and complex schedule and oral therapy, this is no different. And I would say that uh, this is a vaccine that is quite efficacious. I don't know if we did a bit of disservice to the field, of course, wasn't none of us here on the call, um, you know, uh, our call in measuring what we mean by effective uh, vaccine. I mean, this was measured by new cases of uh, COVID-19, some of them symptomatic, other none. I think, uh, you know, you have to look at severe disease, you have to look at hospitalization, you have to look at death, and of course, at variant. And the J&J, &J, despite overall, when you put moderate and severe, it's 66%. For severe diseases, over 80% hospitalization near 100%, even in the South variant, uh, you know, the effectiveness was more than 50%. And we still don't understand, as I said, the immune system well to see what that means. It could be more. We think always of less, but it could be more. So this is as close as possible to a, a game changer. I think uh, it should be deployed and it could be deployed in, uh, you know, places of disparities that don't have, um, you know, the vaccine, especially with the surges that uh, uh, we're seeing in Brazil, in Mexico, and other places. Dr. Kudrujana. I, I completely agree with Tony. I believe the best vaccine is the ones you will find uh, when you are going to be vaccinated that morning in the hospital. So I completely agree with you that primary endpoint in all clinical trials what no, was not zero conversion, but was mortality. Uh, decrease in hospitalization and severe disease. So completely agree with you that any one of the vaccines available, in my opinion, uh, is very effective in reducing the risk of severe disease and hospitalization. And that's why it's quite important for our patients to have access to any one of these vaccines. The comment regarding the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, uh, that is an mRNA vaccine, uh, is related to some data that are going to be published in a very important journal, uh, I believe in one week from now, because according to those data, there was also a, an increased risk uh, to get COVID-19 infection with one single shot of that specific vaccine that is completely different from the other ones. In any case, as I said before, very few patients have been studied. It's a study of 54 patients compared to 150 healthcare workers. So there is no definitive conclusion. So our strong message should be to increase awareness of patients, to educate patients, as Jill said before, because they need to understand that 
having access to the vaccine and doing the vaccination is quite important to reduce the risk of severe disease, as you clearly stated. And again, I completely agree with you. Thank you very much. Vaccine skepticism has been on the rise. This problem is happening worldwide with many people worried that the vaccine came out way too fast and we just don't know enough. A country like France that has been deeply affected by the COVID-19 pandemic has the highest rates of vaccine skepticism. Even after 70,000 COVID deaths, almost half of the country has shown strong hesitance to the vaccine. What can we do as an oncology community from patient advocates, nurses, oncologists, and scientists to fight the misinformation? What do you think is the role of social media in all of this? And what can be done by countries to change this? Dr. Peters? Um, well, to start speaking about this COVID-19 vaccine skepticism, it's important to, to keep in mind that vaccine skepticism has always been present for any new vaccine and in general about vaccines, right, depending on the societies in which we evolve. But it has always happened. And, and I invite you to go back to the smallpox story where you had this old, all this painting where people were transforming into cows, right, because of the nature of the vaccine. So just, just be aware that it's all about communication. And again, our patients went to one wave of anxiety to the other one. And now they have to deep dive into a vaccine, which of course needs the support of a very strong communication from our part. But as I was telling initially, we need to encourage to push our patients to make the efforts to get vaccinated. But I never experienced until now the need to convince them. I think our patients have understood that to be able to pursue and continue their cancer care, and also knowing a little bit about the mortality of COVID in their specific cases, even if we don't like to verbalize these numbers, they don't need to be convinced for the majority of them, not our patients. They can read this kind of uh, irrelevant arguments in the digital media, as we can do, but they are waiting for us to, to tell them the truth. And, and I think they're confident that the vaccine is needed to them. Probably one of the arguments about the skepticism is the speed at which this vaccine has been developed, have been developed and made available. And for that, we really need to make people understand the process, right? Nothing was sacrificed in terms of safety management and safety measurement by any regulatory authority. Uh, in the, this case of public health emergency, right, there was this rolling review cycle of all the data continuously making all the usual criteria for any prescription, any administration of a new strategy being fulfilled. The only thing is just the priority which has been given to this uh, rolling review cycle. And that's something we really need to explain to our patients. Maybe the only thing I said it initially that we cannot tell to our patients is our certainty about the activity, the efficacy of the vaccine. One dose, two doses, that's something nobody can claim about because maybe 4%, 3% of, of cancer patients have been enrolled in all of the clinical trials, which doesn't make, make us certain about any kind of activity. So that's what we need to do. Tell them to get the vaccine. And as Tony was telling, let us measure, let us survey, let us look and make sure that the vaccine in your specific situation of chemo, IO, uh, hormonal therapy, uh, is working as well as we expect. But I must say, uh, skepticism is about communication and the follow-up of this patient is about our profession. Dr. Shabaya. So with, when we're talking about vaccine skepticism, we really have to take a step back and deep dive into what that actually means. And so it's, you have to define vaccine skepticism in a much more granular way. And that involves understanding your, your population that you're looking at. And so if you're talking about what percentage of the public wants to get the vaccine right away when it comes out, that's different from a subset who may wanna wait and see what happens after the first few months of the rollout or six months or a year. And then there may be others who will not get it at all and still others who may only get it if it's mandated. And so these are different levels of vaccine skepticism, right? And so what we've seen is um, increasing adoption as the months have passed since these vaccines in the United States um, received the emergency use authorization and have been now received by 
tens of millions of Americans. Now, the the more absurd stories are the ones that you hear about, about you know, microchips being implanted, et cetera, because it, it makes for a good conversation, but that's truly in the fringe, right? The majority of the those who are skeptical about vaccines are, may, are those who want to wait and see, who want to see a bit more safety data than what was um, uh, presented to the FDA for the EUA. And so there's really nothing wrong with that. The important thing is to continue to engage all of your patients in dialogue to continue as a com uh, oncologic community to put the data on the safety and efficacy of these vaccines so that those on the fence um, um, drink, drink the proverbial Kool-Aid. Those who believe that there are microchips that go in there, there, I think that warrants for a different type of consultation, but not that may not be that may not be mitigated by data. Clinical trials and the use of a vaccine. Clinical trial sponsors, investigators, and treating physicians need operational guidance on COVID-19 vaccinations for those with cancer currently enrolled or might be seeking enrollment to a clinical trial. As current vaccines are authorized and not approved in many countries. Are they considered investigational? This could prove problematic as some protocols of many trials include criteria prohibiting the concomitant use of other investigational agents. FDA and EMA have recognized that protocol deviations might be unavoidable and protocol modifications might be required to maximize patient safety during the pandemic. This is a two-part question. One of the things that we have seen with the pandemic is a decrease in enrollment in oncology trials. What do you see as a result of this and what can we do to reverse this as soon as possible? Secondly, the NCCN guidelines came out with a statement not long ago supporting the discussion between those leading clinical trials and patients enrolled in those trials to prevent protocol violations and exclusions. What can be done to make sure that taking the vaccine doesn't hurt the chances of someone going into a trial. Dr. Sabaya. So uh, thank you, Gil, for this uh, wonderful opportunity and you know for putting together this uh, very nice forum. Uh, as Dr. Solange Peters just mentioned, most trials of COVID-19 vaccines excluded patients with active malignancies. Hence, the data on safety tolerability and efficacy of the vaccines in patients with cancer are limited. And beyond the press release from UK on the efficacy of one dose vaccine from patients, we don't know much about the efficacy of COVID-19 vaccines in patients with cancer. I'm really looking forward for the peer review data on, from the data from UK. So given the risk posed by COVID-19 pandemic, the decisions uh, regarding the use of vaccines against COVID-19 in patients participating or enrolled or seeking clinical trials, especially of investigational cancer therapies, need to be very promptly addressed. Patients should not have to choose between either enrolling in an oncology clinical trial or COVID-19 vaccination. Considering the high mortality and morbidity from COVID-19 patients with cancer, the benefit of vaccination here are likely to far outweigh the risk of vaccine-related adverse events. Again, for many patients with rare diseases or specific biomarker diseases, trials testing novel investigational agents might be the best therapeutic option or sometimes maybe the only therapeutic option following the receipt of standard of care therapies. Although we all know that oncology trials are often complex with protocol mandated schedules that may include lab tests, scans, biopsies, or clinical visits at specified time points both the US FDA and the EMA and multiple regulatory authorities across the globe have recognized this, that protocol deviations and protocol modifications might be required to maximize patient safety during the COVID pandemic. This timely regulatory guidance has facilitated industry, academic centers, investigators, and patients in working with their institutional review boards to navigate the pandemic so again, this is one of the silver linings of the pandemic is we have made the clinical trials from being trial centric to more patient centric with use of more telemedicine. And I believe COVID-19 vaccination provides another opportunity 
to focus on patient safety first and then protocols later in the context of clinical trials. A COVID-19 vaccine that has been authorized and are approved by an appropriate regular authority in the respective country should not be considered as an investigational agent for the purpose of clinical trial. And FDA has clearly come up with this. And I'm sure most of the regulatory authorities should come up with this. COVID-19 vaccine should be offered to all patients with cancer, including those participating in clinical trials. Indeed, we recommend that immunization against COVID-19 be the norm, not the exception for patients participating in clinical trials with cancer. Moreover, all eligible patients who have received COVID-19 vaccines should be accepted for all phases of clinical trials, phase one, phase two, phase three, screening studies, surgery studies, any studies, uh, any phase of clinical trial that we can think of. We further recommend that patients in cancer in general, including those patients participating in clinical trials should be prioritized for COVID vaccination as uh, Dr. Uh, Giuseppe uh, Cordigliano and Tony Shuri mentioned, you know, patients participating in these trials often have progressive advanced stage cancer, often undergoing treatments and have to make several visits to the hospital and clinics for study related procedures. So these increase the contact points for these patients and many with multiple touch points, this increases the exposure to SARS-CoV-2 infection. So this is imperative that patients with cancer are at an increased risk of severe COVID-19 inf you know, infection and complication have higher mortality and due consideration should be given to these patients. In addition, due consideration should also be given to other factors in patients with cancer, like age over 65, com comorbidities like COPD, asthma, renal disease, and overcrowding housing, you know, other socioeconomic factors, single parent household, racial and ethnic minorities that we discussed earlier when we prioritize patients for vaccination. Most importantly, in addition to patients with cancer, we also suggest that caregivers and household contacts or close contacts of patients, adults, all adults, regardless of age, should be vaccinated as early as possible whenever they're eligible based on their local guidelines for public va vaccination. Again, this will enable us to further uh, reduce the transmission from close contacts for high patients. So here, our position would be to give COVID vaccinations and make COVID vaccination not an exclusion criteria for patients enrolled on clinical trials. Thank you. Dr. Kurijana. I can just echo, of course, what Vivek said. I completely agree with him. And uh, we need also to recognize that in the last three months, um, any big company doing uh, research and drug development provided some protocol amendments in order to guarantee access to vaccination. So it's no more a protocol deviation or a protocol violation. So as Vivek said, we need to guarantee access to vaccine to all cancer patients in clinical trials as soon as possible, because this is quite important also to accelerate the drug development and to protect our patients, because we know very well the impact of COVID-19 on clinical trials and drug development. Many clinical trials have been delayed in delivering the data, and it means that new treatment that can be that can have a potential impact also on survival on our patients have not been approved in the time that was planned to be. So I, I echo all the comments of Vivek on this. Dr. Solomon. Thanks, uh, thanks, Gillian. I, I, I agree with Giuseppe and, and I think Vivek um, summarized things very nicely in this regard. Clinical trials are an essential part of uh, um, care for patients, well, people with cancer. And, and I think we should make sure that uh, uh, Vivek used the, I think a very nice uh, phrase that um, people shouldn't have to choose between a trial and, and a vaccine. And we, we should make uh, it very easy for both to be an option. And I think we've seen that with how IRB sponsors, regulatory authorities have um, responded in terms of, um, uh, allowing uh, changes and accepting what would have previously been considered violations to trials and 
and um, and hopefully um, some of this flexibility um, in trials and, and again to borrow another phrase Vivek used the patient centered nature of trials will continue beyond uh, beyond COVID. Restrictions. Once vaccines are widely incorporated, where do restrictions stand? What is the future of telemedicine? And do you think that this is something that is here to stay? Dr. Subaya. Thank you, Gil, for the question. You know, lately uh, in the ongoing conversation on how we can defeat, you know, COVID-19, Again, uh, there are three layers and on, on, you know, you know, people discuss about defeating COVID. One is eradicating COVID, one is eliminating COVID and one is controlling COVID. And I think there are certain countries that can eliminate COVID or eradicate COVID and in certain countries where we can control the COVID. And we are still learning more about that. And experts, uh, especially virologists uh, and immunologists have made a reference to the Swiss cheese model of pandemic defense. Again, this metaphor is easy to grasp, grasp, right? So multiple layers of protection imagined as Swiss cheese slices block the spread of new coronavirus, including the new variants, the virus that causes you know, COVID-19. As we all know, no one layer is perfect. Each has holes. And when the holes align, the risk of infection increases. But when all these layers are combined, like social distancing, wearing masks, hand washing, testing, tracing, ventilation. Importantly, government messaging, state messaging, local messaging. These significantly reduce the overall risk of acquiring COVID infection. Vaccination, vaccination to all eligible population will add one more protective layer. And to answer your second question regarding telemedicine, again, as with any disruptive healthcare innovation or with any disruptive innovation, usually it takes time and a catalyst before it becomes fully embraced. We all had telemedicine, you know, the, the systems were there, the Zoom medicine was there, all the EHRs were there, but you know, the medical community uh, did not embrace it. Less than 1% of the primary care, for instance, did telemedicine uh, before the pandemic, before February 2020. With the coronavirus pandemic, this innovation is at the forefront transforming the healthcare landscape. I think this is going to be one of the silver linings of the pandemic. Again, in April, May, and June, you know, the telemedicine came from 1% of primary care to nearly 50% of primary care in April, May, June last year. With telemedicine's current trajectory and rapid adoption rate, I think it has a potential to disrupt and redefine the way healthcare systems operate, deliver care and manage costs. And because costs and financial toxicity are one of the great veins of modern healthcare system, this sets the stage for a vastly different healthcare experience in the future. So again, my predictions uh, are three for telemedicine. Telemedicine will become standard of care service offered across all care settings. Number two, patients will choose, doctors will choose healthcare systems and hospitals based on telemedicine access. Access to specialists, subspecialists, oncologists, second opinions will be the norm, which will benefit patients, hospitals, and practice systems in the big picture of things. Thank you. Yeah, I, you know, I think Vivek did a great job summarizing this. I, I wanna divide this into two. First is uh, how things uh, gonna happen after in terms of restriction, washing hands, etc. I mean, listen, those are uh, hygienic things that always, you know, will help. If we look at the rate of hospitalization, almost anywhere we have data from the UK, from the United States and other, of other viral illnesses we forget about, like the flu, you know, the rate are way, way low. So someone like me who, who gets, uh, uh, you know, sick every year, every other uh, year in January or February with two, three days, I I'm gonna wear uh, my mask. I'm gonna have my mask indoor during the flu season, especially that the vaccine against the flu, some years are 30 to 40% effective. That's a personal choice. And perhaps that's a choice that can protect also my patient, because I could be the 
culprit here. So that's one, and we have to see how you know it evolves. Uh, we can only control really our behavior. The second thing about telemedicine, I largely agree, but not completely uh, with Vivek. At least in the United States, the system is based almost entirely on incentives. So we have to see how the telemedicine based incentive and reimbursement is. However, what Vivek said is very important in terms of uh, the patient driving this. So if the patient as a whole, now that they have a great experience, decide to go to places that provide flexibility, provide telemedicine, provide these services, then that's what cannot uh, drive insurance companies uh, to change. I agree with Vivek and with almost everyone here that uh, you know telemedicine is here to stay. There's a lot of advantages. There are some you know, things where patients need to be seen face-to-face. Uh, -face. But I would say I conducted, I conducted uh, even hospice discussions. I would never have thought that where the experience have been superior because of the folks that joined, because of my focus directly on patient rather than on the, you know, electronic medical record, looking at the screen here, I have to look at the patient. So it is here to stay. We have to work and see how's the incentive and the reimbursement system, at least in the United States go. Our final topic is the future. What in your opinion is the biggest lesson we have learned from the past year with COVID-19 and how can they help us move forward worldwide by addressing them and making changes? Thank you, Gil, for putting this together. Uh, what are the lessons learned for COVID and cancer you know, from this pandemic? First, again, the necessity of an international registry for data science, biosurveillance, and also an infrastructure with funding to conduct master arm, multi-arm master clinical trials using shared control arm with ease. Second, the future data collection should focus on attention to details, including patient reported outcomes, both acute and chronic. And third, studies of COVID-19 and cancer patients should start reporting viral loads and all immunological parameters. As Dr. Tony Shorty said, we don't know a lot about the immunology and cancer and COVID. And most of the COVID-19 and cancer studies have been rapidly reported. The rapid reporting should not compromise on the accuracy, veracity, and validity of all the data. All studies should ensure that they have appropriate regulatory approval and have mechanisms for sharing de-identified data and that they should be source verifiable and auditable by independent third-party authorities. One more thing I've seen is most of the studies reporting COVID-19 and cancer, you know, patients with cancer are all reported from patients who are very sick and admitted to the hospital in the ICU. We need to know about the big picture. We need to know uh, studies. We need to, there is a need to report all patients with COVID-19, including patients who are not admitted to cancer, who may be less symptomatic, who may be less sick, who may be asymptomatic. And to compare the data sets of patients with COVID-19 without cancer as a contemporaneous control population. Again, one of the important things is, you know, effort should also be made to collect data from pediatric patients. If pediatric patients with cancer also get COVID-19, we want to make sure that, you know, pediatrics, you know, children with cancer should not be stepchildren in terms of all this research going on. And kids with cancer and COVID-19 should be included in part of these studies. More systemic collaboration is needed among clinical researchers, epidemiologists, and basic translational researchers in elucidating the fundamental mechanisms and immunobiology of patients with COVID and patients with cancer. Again, you know, the growing body of evidence of the effects of COVID-19 on patients with cancer, it may be time to reflect, revisit, revise and recognize, and even rework all the guidelines put forth, put forth by the major cancer organizations and amend their recommendations as we learn as more prospective evidence accumulates to confront COVID-19 and cancer is to encounter two parallel threats. Global efforts offer a reason to advance our understanding of the huge gaps in knowledge of these two life-threatening diseases. 
this too shall pass, we shall prevail. But we need to learn from this pandemic. You know, we need to definitely not be in the same situation with the next pandemic. We may, hopefully we don't get a next pandemic. Hopefully we, this is it. But I think nature, you know, there is, there are a lot of uh, you know, viruses and nature threats out there. We need to be uh, cognizant of that and be ready for this. Thank you. Just a final comment. I believe uh, what we learned, uh, the most important uh, lessons, I believe, is that we are here at 11.20 in the night to discuss about COVID and cancer. So for sure, these pandemics um, gave to me the opportunity to meet a lot of people all around the world uh, and increased my collaboration with many outstanding clinical scientists like the ones are here tonight. So helped us better to understand which is the value of collaboration beyond the barriers of any single country. And I believe also the success of the vaccines in one year is a result of this. Well, I just sort of also wanted to echo Giuseppe's comment, uh, mainly on the fact that I think in a way the COVID situation has brought the whole world together. Uh, although there is no travel uh, face to face in, in on, on the other aspect, I think I've seen Ben and Giuseppe more often than ever uh, this year than before. And we've had several different webinars, meetings together. And in a way, we've also managed to improve uh, the education of our fellows uh, by having exposure to all these events, which are now being made available online through the technology that we're forced to use. And now we're very familiar with using and, you know, echoing our previous discussion about what will stay and what will not. This is definitely something that will stay. And hopefully we could use this as also a platform uh, for further collaborations. Thank you, Robert. You know, one thing I want to finish with, we're all in cancer, whether cancer physician, cancer advocate, etc. But we're citizen of uh, planet Earth and hopefully planet Earth is here, you know, uh, to stay. There are things I learned from the pandemic, you know, as a citizen, more so as a cancer doc. First, we cannot cheapen and uh, we cannot just not think that another pandemic or a catastrophe is not going to happen. And as I said, I'm a big believer in localism. I think you know, mask, N95, you, you shouldn't, states how it happens in the US, shouldn't be scrambling again, pit against each other. Ventilator, having, you know, the power to be able to be sufficient at a local level is very, very important. The second thing is, you know, let the experts speak. Not everything need to be politicized. In the US, it was a nightmare you know, how things were politicized out of nowhere. I mean, I know here Ben is a lung oncologist. I'm an oncologist. I understand the data well. I would think 10 times before even, you know, mentioning thoracic oncology in front of him. In COVID, suddenly we had, you know, experts out of nowhere. And many of them, even if they consider or not themselves experts, have been on purpose spreading misinformation. So imagine a clinical trial that was on purpose falsified. How do we feel about that? That's why as citizen, we have to fight that. We do not have big guns to fight, but we have other ways to fight that. And we cannot allow at all misinformation to get again, because this is our you know, lives at stakes. We cannot just stay in our line, lanes because of that. So hopefully we learned. And again, I'm closer to many of you. I know I met uh, many of you over Zoom, Jill, Herbert, and others over meeting. And I hope this is a silver lining that's going to make us stronger. And then, thank you, Tony. Ben? Yeah. So, again, echoing um, a lot of the comments, sadly, I, I think we, we will have to learn from this and deal with the pandemic in the future. Hopefully, not in all our working lives, but it may happen. But I think. Um, so, you know, what, what, what have we learned? I, I think two things for me that are important, uh, the importance of addressing inequities, um, uh, inequities in cancer care, in, inequities in medical care, because the pandec pandemic has exposed how, um, how the vulnerable are impacted so much more than uh, uh, people with resources at an economic level, at a health level. And, and solutions um, uh, that uh, extend beyond on oncology need to um, be addressed to correct these uh, in in inequities. 
The other thing is the importance of collaboration. The collaboration is at a local level, a state level, a national level, and importantly, an international level. Um, uh, I think, uh, as Tony was just saying, we, we are all citizens of, of the one planet, and, and we've shown that we can work together. And um, you know, hopefully this uh, helps us to work, uh, work together better. Well, I echo what all of you said, and I just want to say I appreciate all of your efforts and your passion and your work towards uh, helping people with cancer kind of tackle some of these um, issues that have come up with COVID-19. I The collaboration that we're all part of planet Earth, Tony, I love that. I feel like this was a perfect example of what we can accomplish when you break down barriers, when you share data, when you work collaboratively for the better good of patients. And it's, it's been incredible to see, and I only hope that moving forward, it can, we can continue to do that within cancer, within cancer research. Obviously the speed of it will not be the same, but the urgency is the same for patients. So I really love that. I think we've learned that, um, you know, with a lot about clinical trials, and I hope that some of the guidelines that have put into place for those will continue with clinical trials. I think we've learned that patients and advocates can be a bigger part of, you know, different conferences and sharing different perspectives. And I have really enjoyed getting to know all of you. I really have enjoyed everything that I've participated in. And it's been a lot more. I mean, prior to COVID, I tra traveled a couple of times a month and went to conferences, but not the same opportunities that have been. And I think we've learned from each other. And I think that's what's so wonderful about it is the communication between physicians and researchers and patient advocates has been incredible. And, you know, I think one last thing, there's a lot of other things, but importantly is the effective communication between everybody. And that is important for, in all aspects. And if I encourage one thing though, from all of you, and especially from physicians moving forward is one thing that we as people with cancer have learned is truly, I mean, I've always believed I don't wanna just survive, I wanna live. And that means going and doing. And while, People with cancer, when COVID hit, we're used to living with the uncertainty. I mean, we live uh, three months at a time. What are my scans going to show? <clears throat> but it's been a tough year. And so I just encourage you to help your patients find a way to live. And, you know, that article came out from in um, with the CDC uh, recommending that people with cancer who are vaccinated don't change the way that they're living. And I just hope that that could be looked at um, more objectively and you can still help your patients, like I said, find a way to live because that's, <laughs> that's what we need to do. So thank you. We thank you all for joining us for this exciting OncoAlert Roundtable. I thank our amazing OncoAlert faculty panel and every one of our colleagues worldwide for your support. Sending our best from all of us on OncoAlert and stay safe.